Hey, good morning. Thanks for joining us today for our Wardrobe Wednesday focused McMaster seminars. Of course, this year we are online, we're virtual. We're very sad to not be at the festival this year, as I know you all are, but we're bringing you some behind the scenes love this year. My name is Brianne Ritchie. I work in the education department at the Stratford Festival. And if we were in person with each other last year, it's a pleasure to see you again. If this is the first time that you're joining us in this online forum, uh, yesterday was a really great discussion with sound designer Peter McBoyle. And today we have some very special guests. I'm gonna start by introducing Kel and Alan Pirot, who are going to be moderating our discussion. Kel holds a PhD in English Literature and is the owner of KMP and Associates Creative Communication Services. Say that 10 times fast. She's a proud <laughs> member of ACTRA and Canadian Actors' Equity and was a co-founder of Ottawa Theatre Company, Plosive Productions. Kel has done program notes and given lectures for the Stratford Festival for 15 years. Alan Piro is Associate Professor of English and Director of the Centre for the Study of Theory and Criticism at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario. He's also Editor-in-Chief of English Studies in Canada. He's co-editor and contributor to The Many Facades of Edith Sitwell, 2017, and is currently working on an Encyclopedia of Cultural Theory with Kell for the University of Toronto <laughs> Press and an on book and on a book length project on camp and modernism. Thank you so much for being here, Kel and Alan. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. It's nice to be here. Awesome. And I'll introduce our very special guests from the festival. First up is Dana Osborne. Hi, Dana. Hi. Dana is the costume designer of Chicago, Here's What It Takes, and Frankenstein Revived in what would have been Stratford's 2020 season, but a lot of the work already happened with that, of course. This is Dana's 20th season with Stratford. She's been the costume designer of 25 productions, including the Rocky Horror Show and Guys and Dolls. Dana was also the set and costume designer on Timon of Athens and Henry IV, part one. She's also worked at many other theaters, including the Goodman Theater in Chicago, the Grand Theater, Citadel, Ross Petty Productions, at the Shaw Festival, Blythe, Pacific Opera, among many others. She's received two Dora Awards and one Sterling Award for costume design and was the 2012 recipient of the Virginia and Myrtle Cooper Award in costume design. Thanks for being here, Dana. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. And Leela Stairs Murphy. Hi, Leela. Hi. Leela's in her 20th season as well with the Stratford Festival, <laughs> working as a cutter and head of wardrobe at the Studio Theatre. Beyond Stratford, she's worked throughout North America as a cutter for the National Theatre School in Montreal, the Edmonton Opera, the Citadel in Edmonton, the Royal Manitoba Theatre Centre, and the Boston Ballet. Most recently, Leela created costumes for the National Ballet's production of Swan Lake, celebrating Karen Kane's 50th season. Leela graduated from Ryerson University with a degree in fashion design and has since completed additional training in tailoring, stretch, and dancewear. She did two apprentice programs with the Stratford Festival in both women's wear and traditional tailoring. She's also taught period drafting at Fanshawe College and at Es Artes in Sushi Toto, El Salvador. Leela has been involved in costume production for other significant events, including the opening ceremonies of the 2010 Vancouver Olympic Games and the Toronto Pride Parade. She's the recipient of two Guthrie Awards. Hooray, look at this fantastic panel. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. I'm gonna hand it over to Dana and Leela to tell us a little bit about how they got into the industry and their background, and then leave it to you, Cal Allen, Dana, and Leela. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is really great. I hear there are some people on the West Coast watching us or watching us after. Uh, I'm originally from Duncan, British Columbia, which is between Victoria and Nanaimo on um, Vancouver Island. Uh, I never heard of the Stratford Festival until I came <laughs> to Ontario. Um, but I know it's changed a bit. I think more people know out there. Um, I came to Ontario to be an actor and quickly realized that was not my path uh, and went to York University, studied there, their theater design program. And after that, started working in wardrobes, um, worked for the Shaw and the Mervishes when we did the Lion King and the Mamma Mia the first time around in the 90s or, or 2000. 
Uh, and then I started at Stratford in 2001 as a design assistant and uh, worked my way into the position I hold now and in the work I do around the country. Leela? Uh, thanks for having me as well. Um, I'm actually from Stratford originally. My parents were teachers here. Mm -hmm. And I went to um, Ryerson for fashion design. And while I was there, I quickly realized that fashion design was a lot harder in Canada. And having grown up in Stratford and having the theater around me all the time, I thought I'd poke my head in and do a few sewing tests and see what it was all about and uh, fell in love with it. Began sewing for five years and with all my pattern drafting and draping skills, I wanted to become a pattern drafter. So I was, um, I was offered an apprenticeship and I did my first one in women's wear and then um, started cutting a little bit, but then um, ended up going back doing some sewing and uh, did a second apprenticeship in tailoring. And here we are, I've just kept cutting throughout um, Canada, getting experience at different places um, in opera and ballet and musicals, Shakespeare's. Um, yeah, so that's about it there. <laughs> Other than my bio that Brienne started with, so. I know, it's always weird to hear someone say your bio. I'm always like. Like my resume. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Who is this person? Yes, that's what I always think. Yeah, wow, that sounds impressive. That's not me. <laughs> Who is this person? It's, it's a good thing to try and keep the straight face through, right? Um, uh, we, uh, Leela and I, have, again, 20 years together at the festival. Um, so we kind of got together and decided to sort of talk about the process that we go through. Um, and I... My a thing I really believe in is design is an ensemble art. And also in that, you're only uh, as good as a designer as the team you work with and especially the cutter you work with. And that relationship is really, really important. So the process that I start with, um, I get hired, I get the play, I read the play, I talk to the director, we come up with a concept, we talk about different time periods or whatever it is. I go away from that. I create something called a costume scenic breakdown where it's each actor, what parts they're playing, if they're only playing one part, how many times they change and I map out the entire show. So I really start doing it more from the strategic sort of um, layout. After that, then I go into the reference and you'll see later on when we start talking about Leela and our, our, my process, the reference plays a really strong part and I it can be from anything it can be like I you know there are reproductions of catalogs from different periods um, my favorite ones are these hilarious like 1970s Sears ones and stuff like that or you can get oh yeah again. they're awesome I go all the way back to like you know we go through paintings depending where you are whatever the original you know original source material you can get and now it's changed so much when I was a young designer you would go to the Metro Ref library and go through little magazines or, or books and now so I do have a good collection of books I also spend some time on the internet in Pinterest or Instagram or like there's images, images, images. And, and it really is uh, what, it, what I can collect visually. I'm literally putting the picture together somewhere in my brain, it's all going together into something. So it's, it's a lot of different things. It could just be a color, it could be a texture, it could be anything. And that's sort of those ideas get to shape each other. And then I start the rendering process. So, um, that starts with a preliminary drawing, and you will see that later on when we sort of talk through, um, when we talk through things, uh, which is usually just a pencil sketch. It's, and actually, I don't think I have a prelim. They're really rough, and the faces are distorted, and hands and heads are rarer. But it's the idea of the silhouette, and there's um, notes in there to, to, and that goes to the wardrobe, and they get, the, they get it, and then they, we start to talk about costing it. Because, you know, at some part of your art, they need to figure out if they can afford it. So we do all that. If it gets approved, it goes back to me again. Um, and then I do the final sketch. So my final sketches usually start in, in um, just in pencil. 
and usually because I haven't had time to to paint the actual <laughs> rendering yet. But you know what? That works really well for our, our process because it gives Leela a chance or the cutter, the tailor, to kind of make notes on it and scratch their own things into it. Show me seams that I haven't thought about or all that stuff and you'll see as we go on. And then that sketch goes back to wardrobe again. The wardrobe management um, prices it all out in these big sheets. Um, and if it is approved, signed off, then I can get paid my second installment. I get paid in three. So I get paid when I sign the contract. I get paid when it, it is approved. And I get paid when the show opens. So that can be over a course of a year. So I have to be very good at budgeting sometimes. Um, uh, then, because I there were some questions about pulling stock or, or do we reuse mm -hmm. costumes? A, a part of your budget will be trying to balance what you can find existing, what you could buy in stores, what you're going to make. It's sort of those three parts. So at that point, I spent some time in our extensive uh, warehouse. If you have a chance to come to Stratford and take a tour, it's in its amazing space. Uh, I can't even tell you how many things are in there. It's just huge and massive. And it's also such a testament to the the craftsmanship and the designers. And I love finding things and knowing exactly who made it because of something they did on it or, or finding <laughs> my favorite thing every once in a while is an assistant will pull something out and they go, Oh my God, this is ugly. And I'll be like, I designed that. <laughs> it's a really good humbling moment just to bring it up. You do change. Your style does change. And some stuff, there's some stuff there that's from the 70s that's really done in orange and brown. And, you know, it could be period, but it's orange and brown. And you're like, polyester. Polyester. Polyester, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, but there are wonderful things. There are wonderful gems there that you end up pulling some of those things in. And that is also something when you're heading to your cutter meetings, which is, I think, the next part of this. Oh, no, I haven't done fabric shopping. Okay. <laughs> and then um, in that budget, there's been uh, a line about how much um, uh, cost you can for fabric. So it's like $25 a yard or whatever it is. And then... Uh, I'm very, very lucky, but it seems to be the way that um, fabric shopping is going is that I usually end up getting sent to, to New York City uh, once a year to fabric shop there. There's an area of town called Midtown where most of the fabric stores still exist. The problem is now with the cost of rent, some of them are getting pushed out to Brooklyn or um, different areas. So I do spend about um, four days, five days going through all the stores there trying to find deals because at the end of the, at the, end of the day, um, there's just so, so much more to look at. There is yardage. We start buying things if we like it. We have it shipped to, um, to back to the theater and it's, it's cost effective. I know that sounds bizarre, but it actually is at the end of the day. Um, and then in Canada, there we certainly spend a lot of time in Toronto, in Hamilton. I am a good friend of Lens Mill and Fabricant. <laughs> like, you'll be amazed what you can find. Um, and you start swatching or purchasing fabric. Swatching is when you usually get a little piece of it. Sometimes I pay to buy a 10 centimeter strip of it. Um, um, but usually they'll give you a little swatch for free and then, or you pay for the big ones. And if I'm unsure with the fabric, I just bring those swatches back because we have buyers that can call New York with a picture of the fabric and they send it to us later and dumb thing. There is also uh, extensive catalogs of different wholesalers where we can get silks and all that kind of stuff. So we have that a sort of a, a catalog library in um, the buying department where there's probably about 70 different vendors that we can also purchase fabric for. So it's really about that um, constant big picture, also not being afraid to make mistakes. There will be lots of mistakes made along the sort of process. And, um, and then once that's all together, usually that all happens. Let's say if we're working on a, if we're thinking about a musical, because Lila and I have done a bunch of those together. And I think the majority of what we're talking about today is those. Um, that would all happen before January. So I would start drawing in August. 
And by January, I have the drawings, I'm approved, I've got fabric, I'm ready to go. <laughs> and Leela comes into the building and yay, it's the best day when the cutters show up um, because, you know, this is it. And also the, the act of having the conversation, I find solidifies a lot of the little details you haven't thought about or expands to even better, um, better ideas. So, um, do you want to jump in there, Lila? Or? Yeah, that's perfect because this that is kind of where I jump in. You but have I'll, your I'll, own process before I show up. Too. Yeah, I'll catch yeah. myself up. So, yeah. I take a lot of the similar process that Dana does. So, I'll read the play or watch the movie. The movie is great. Um, also, but keeping in mind that the designer never does what the movie is. So, it just gives you a flavor. It gives you the time period. It gives you an idea of what you're um, going into, what you're getting yourself into. Um, and then once I start back to work in January, um, I get a lot of my paperwork and information from wardrobe management as they'll provide me with budgets, et cetera, but also some prelim sketches and um, some inspiration photos. So the designer will, like Dan was saying, get all these images and it also it provides the flavor and it provide it sets my fire like it gets me really going for the season and um from there i then start researching even without the designer coming to my table yet um into some shapes and silhouettes and what my patterns are going to start looking like and depending on timing um because it's a rep theater that we work at we're working on multiple plays at once i will also start drafting blocks um, which are patterns for individual, or I should say custom patterns for individual actors, um, knowing what our casting is. And then also being fluid with that, because sometimes casting changes up until the last minutes and, and whoever um, is in that position or, or in, that, in that role, I should say. So um, then as soon as we can, I start having uh, design meetings or cutter, cutters talks, as they're usually called. And uh, Dana gives us a, a big show and tell. So it's an overview of the whole macro picture. We all sit in a room together as all the cutters and we get to see everything we're not working on, <laughs> which is great because you get very, very focused on what you're working on. So it's nice to see the whole view. I get to see the set. I get to see the little maquette mock-up of the set. And uh, we get to talk about um, the swatches and the colors and everything that Dana's pulled together. So. Um, then we meet, so we can kind of go back and forth now, Dana. Like, um, you and have maybe a block behind you at all? Is there a block on that wall? Yeah, way? yeah. I bet I do. No it's going to be so hard to see. Oh, okay, but That's a um, big thing. it's folded brown paper. Yeah. You can't see so it. there's like an armhole. It's a unique yeah. hole there, and it goes up to the neck, and it's essentially like it's almost a fitted vest in a way. Yeah, so it's a it's a, a loose fitted bodice that I can take um, and apply all custom sizes from my from my actor. So I'll take custom measurements. Whether I have those measurements or not, I sometimes have to wait for the design or the excuse me, the um, actor to get into the building depending on their contract. But if they've been with us in the past, chances are I'll have an old copy of their measurements on hand and uh, I'll throw I'll whip that out of my back pocket and start drafting up something that will fit them precisely and then I get the sketches from the designers and I can more specifically start adapting those lines to the silhouette and all the style lines that the designer wants so so but I can't do that until I get an idea of where we are going with the sketch so that's where I start using the sketches um, as a tool I need those pictures I need those drawings mm -hmm. to actually refer to um, as a, it's as as important as my scissors, as my pencil, I need those sketches as a tool, so. So Dave, do you want to give us the first slide, if, if possible? That's perfect. So. Yeah, for sure, I'll bring that up. Thank you. Um, thank you. What we, perfect timing. We kind of went backwards, uh, you know, I, oh yeah, perfect. Like there is, these are Chicago, but we don't really want to go there yet because that's going to be next year, so. <laughs> so and I An kind element of, of surprise. I know. <laughs> Leela and I went back to um, Carousel, which we did uh, 2015. I'm gonna that's say. right. Is that right? Yep, that's great. Right. And so, it, as you can see on your left, this it would be sort of the pencil final sketch that Leela gets. It actually is like right out of Leela's book here. Yeah. 
this gives her the opportunity to, because I, I really appreciate that, um, uh, because I am the idea person. I am, I, I am not um, a sewer. I can sew, but I'm, I'm not a sewer. I'm not a drafter. Where in fashion, the, the fashion designer is usually also uh, has that ability to make patterns. Like that's their history. That's how they start building their brand up. And then at some point, someone takes that away. But certainly in theater, you were relying on this, these other amazing brains to bring it to life. So this, like, I would be like, hey, so here's a sketch. And then here are some of the references that I was inspired by. Um, and then we can, we can start to talk. Then Leela can actually start drawing on top of it. So, because I, I love... Because yeah. that becomes our collaboration. We start yeah. talking about what works, what doesn't work. Um, and we also, I should mention, we talk about uh, what does the garment have to do? Mm -hmm. Does it have to dance? Does it have to be quick changed? Um, what's the functionality of it? Because that's also a huge role in how I will draft it. So, And, and also, who's the actor? The actor is, Absolutely. again, um, the actor is not a neutral thing. The actor is a person that we know. Um, most of these people we know very intimately. Um, we all uh, are aware of things that they like, things that they don't like. We try and pay attention to all those little things. If they um, have a pacemaker, because you can't use magnets in their costume. If they have an insulin pump, where they like to put that. Like all these sort of things, we end up learning all these elements. Where are their tattoos? Because sometimes you're designing a something and that there's a tattoo across your whole body. Like, so you have to know the actor, know what they're comfortable with. Um, and that's, a, and be prepared to be flexible too. Um, and so this is sort of where we started for and Mrs. Mullins, who is the carnival, who owns the carnival and is in love with um, the, the gentleman whose name, of course, I know the actor's name, Jonathan Winsby, but the character name is sort of passing right now. Um, uh, so yeah, we can go to the, the thing about this, Leela, what I love about these references too, is that it yeah. describes, this is from a catalog. So it describes what the fabric would have been, um, what some of the measurements were. Cause sometimes it's really interesting to see what they really were. Cause this is how you ordered your clothes or you ordered what, the pattern. What I love about this slide that you provided, Dana, is that it's a perfect illustration of how you've taken the back of one the front of another and we're going to use this skirt and it's a very good illustration of how we can kind of meld a whole lot of ideas together and um, make one mm -hmm. yeah and again this this had to be danceable and as you see in the, in the little back sketch in the corner we needed to throw a zipper in it it needs to be when you're doing a musical you tend to throw giant quick change zippers and everything because you don't know how quickly it needs to come off um, so there is that and also where the mic pack placement would be and so this would be under the bustle um, Stuff like that dance boots petticoats um, Also in the when you're doing a, a period show um, uh, Where you're wearing a corset we tend not to do a real corset uh, For dance there's no the flexibility in it. So it tends to be boned inside the corset or uh, sorry inside the bodice and not a corset or if we do have a corset we do panels of um lycra on the sides or something so they can breathe because it's also you're trying to create the shape but you need the actor to be able to expand their diaphragm to sing these notes right um yeah we can go to the next slide so then this is me oh and at this moment too i'm probably showing leela some of my fabrics and there are she's allowed the moment when she's like no i'm gonna work it. <laughs> You know, because it is, um, I, I've learned a lot over the years, but there are sometimes I'm like, don't you think kind of, we've kind of put two together and because we also have to think of a hundred shows, a hundred shows, a hundred uh, moments of sweating, um, dancing, doing all that kind of stuff. So we're act, asking these fabrics to do a lot. Um, so it's important. And also thinking about trying to maintain them, try and think about crushability, think about um, cleaning them, that kind of stuff. So I think this ended up the, the, the final sketch, which again, this is when I was using watercolor pencils and I, I've moved away from that. It's just too <laughs> pale. 
<laughs> but the idea but it's is so pretty. So pretty. It was funny. It was actually really fun doing like going back through old designs, like going into the basin and just hauling stuff down and looking. And I was like, oh wow, you know, it's a. It's I agree. Like, it's a good COVID. Uh, <laughs> 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 I think uh, the next slide is the actual photo of Robin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, that's on the stand. So this, this is perfect. Stand. So this is before we did the, we don't have the neck fichu in there yet or the, or the, right? That's correct. Where did you put the zipper? I can't even see the zipper. It's in the front? It, yep, it's center front. Oh, it's center front on this one. Great. So that popped off in the skirt. So this was, yeah, this is as we go and you can, and then in, um, so we, it's nice to see all three views. These are magic little Leela shots that you had. <laughs> I take a lot of photos of the work in progress because um, it gives me the distance. Uh, sometimes I'm too on top of my work. Um, I'm sure some artists in the audience will understand that when you're so up close to things, um, you tend to just narrow in and, and have that, uh, that narrow focus. So. I find taking a photo of it allows me to step very far away from it and take a look at what the audience will be seeing. And in our four different theaters, it's a very different experience for the audience in the sense of how a fabric reads. Um, in yeah. the, uh, it, so we call the Avon theater is the trim eater. It will just eat <laughs> everything. It's just, you could have something up there that is the brightest, boldest thing and it will not read <laughs> I don't know what it is about the distance of the house um I had a couple students here a couple years ago and we picked three fabrics and we went from theater to theater and theater and I made them look at each one in different theaters and they were just like you're yeah it's it's remarkable so as you can see there's a this sort of dark line going around all these elements which I think I'm sure a few people are like boy that's hard it's a hard line but you need, uh, and it's a Patrick Clark trick, you need this sort of a shadow drop line in that theater to make the details pop. And again, this is, she's a bit of a garish character. She, she likes color and, um, and uh, details. And she thinks she, she has a higher status than anyone that lives in this small coastal town. So there's choices there. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think the next shot is probably Robin Hutton in the costume. So you can see those lines just add to the silhouette, but they don't jump as much as when you're in the thing. And that's the other thing in a fitting room. When you're in a fitting room, you got to mm. get out of the fitting room. I try and stand in the hallway so I'm at least 10 feet from the actor. And I, I do this face a lot. I go, <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the 40 the squinty eyes. You know, I need to kind of squint and just see you can just see what's not sitting right another trick with actors too sometimes is if they're uncomfortable um they will put their hands to the part of their body it's just they're doing it subconsciously so we're always watching their body language to make sure we're aware of and there's something that's poking them or some area they're not they're not feeling lands because it really is for us that moment together in the room where you, you can actually watch the actor become the character. They, they finally, it's like buying into it finally, or all that amazing work they're doing in the room that you are getting notes on continuously, uh, it will suddenly drop. It's, it's so satisfying. It really is the magic, magic moment. And this is usually before tech dress if we're really lucky. But, That's um, such a helpful thing that you taught me, Dana, was um, watching their hands and watching what they say, or uh, so, I'm so sorry, watching what they don't say. It's the body language. Because uh, not only are we trying to build a character, but this person, this actor, has to be super comfortable uh, going on stage because they're in such a vulnerable situation having to remember lines and songs and placement and choreo. And mm -hmm. as if they're not thinking about their costume, I feel like we've done our job well. Yeah. Yeah, because once you get dressed in the morning, you usually don't think about it all day. You just yeah. clothes and you get to, you go and live your life. And that's essentially what you need, unless it's some part of the, of the action that's happening. That's what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I mean, I love this one. It's such a fantastic. So pretty. Shows up at the, I think at this, uh, at the wharf. And they have that scene. It's really great. Yeah. Um, the next slide, please. 
So this is uh, Mrs. Mullen's first costume. Um, and that is, was that me that kept doing the feedback? You guys hearing feedback? Is it just me? It's me. Okay. Um, Maybe Dave can help us with that. Dave. Yeah, I'm not sure who that's coming from at the moment. I can back up a little bit. Maybe it's my face. I think it's okay right, right okay. now. It's uh, good now. Is it good now? Is that better? Yeah. We're getting too close. Um, so again, you're seeing the sketch from Leela's uh, initial mm. part where I'm sort of throwing a few details in there, um, different textures. This is another thing that happens is sometimes I do this terribly mean thing where I just find a piece of fabric and I'm like, and there's not really enough of it. And I show up with four and I'm like, could you make this into? So Leela has this job where she's like, oh. so she's sure, sure, right? Yeah, you're always like, sure, I'll try. And this is, I think this dress, I was like, I have a feeling I showed up only with four and a half and I needed you to do the skirt and bits. And, and I think the pleating was all based on what you could have gotten out of it. Am I right? Yes, and we oh, draped yes. it so I could use the fabric in the best way. And <laughs> what I loved about that challenge, though, is it's the creative problem solving. Because it, you might think it's a horrible thing, but it actually isn't. It's when your creative juices really start flowing. Because I kind of I really enjoy that part of my job, is making that, that impossible thing happen. To an extent, there's definitely times when I've had to say, yeah, that's not possible. <laughs> But I do enjoy the the times when it's like, all right, make some art out of this. And this yeah. was one of them. This bodice was so fun to drape. So fun. And I I feel like that's a piece of, I sometimes I call fabric like, it's just like, uh, you know, two molecules away from being a garbage bag. Sometimes it's just like the worst fabric. And I think this kind of was one. And you <laughs> think it's amazing. If you want to go to the next shot, it might be... Uh, I think in process. Yeah. There so we go. Like Leela doing this unbelievable drape work um, across the bottom. And I remember how hard you were like, like trying to sort of make it all. See, and every once in a while I come in and just move a little bit over or whatever. But it's just, it's stunning. It was such a fun, fun costume. That's, and the, that's the secret. Little, um, yeah. Carousel. That's the secret with Dan and I is we, we just leave stuff on stands and then she comes around in the evening when I'm not there. <laughs> And I come in in the morning and I'm like, look, it's a thing. Or, or I take pictures and I draw all over the picture. Yeah, yeah, that's it's great. It's also a handy way because yeah, Leela and I both have daughters. Um, mine is 10 and yours is 12, 13. 13. So sometimes we can't go in at night like we used to. But, um, <clears throat> but yeah, there is, there's, it's, so it's trying to find, keeping it, the technology does help because then she can send me a photo if I'm stuck at a, um, you know, picking up after school or something and I can send some notes and see how it goes. Or even if you're stuck in Toronto doing some shopping and I'm at an integral moment where I have a question, I can't go forward. It's, it's great that I can just uh, send a, a quick photo and we can discuss that way. So it works well. It's just, it's also about having the rapport with your designer of being able to have someone so approachable like Dan and be able to ask all those questions. So well, and and I, not be not be scared to ask because like you were talking about making mistakes, I make a lot of mistakes, but I can ask some silly questions too. But usually, it gets us to an ultimate finished product. So <laughs> yeah, and I think I think in general these days, like in just in general in life these days, it's it's learning to make mistakes. Um, yeah. successfully. they lead to fantastic choices. They lead to vulnerability. They lead to, they, they lead to art. You know, these are the kind of things we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this was this was just super super fun. Goodness, everything about it. <laughs> this is the one I want to wear. <laughs> I love the colors of this one. Yeah. It's super fun. I think the uh, next slide is on stage. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. It is. And then they're they're having their fight outside the carousel, and he got he got a matching vest in the end. I think we had enough fabric for a vest. There must have been yeah. some cut, or I called. This this is a great illustration, um, Dana, of your color concept. You're just talking about how the trim eater, the look how dull it looks on stage versus the photos I took in the in the shop. Yeah. 
Yeah, you, you can be pretty darn shocked. And if you ever have end up having, now again, I'm behind a projection, I, they're in front of a projection screen as well. But this is, um, uh, this is not an LED screen, it's a traditional projection screen. So if you ever are designing a show for any designers that are watching this, if you were ever in front of an LED screen, like think of Beyonce at a big concert or something it is, the, a good way to test your fabric intensity is to hold it in front of your computer screen or your TV screen. And if you can still see the fabric and see the details in the fabric, then it's an, a good one. But that's, um, I, I learned this from my friend Michael, because uh, you can, if you, there are, if the light source behind them is more intense, it will take away any of the intensity that you have in the in the garment and make the people look quite flat. So sometimes you have to like throw insane amount of colors more much brighter than you think for them to really pop, especially when you're fighting against the saying guys and dolls too, with the LED lights that are all around that change colors. That makes me have have to push even further sometimes to really get that under color to to rise and and working with your lighting designer and your projection designers on that. Um, but yeah, this was, this was super fun. Robin was great. Oh, she's awesome. Yeah. Is Rocky next? I don't know. It's, oh, no. It's, oh, no. It's not it's Rocky just, yet. Like, Sorry. Spoiler of, like, alert. <laughs> so things that get thrown around, right? Um, and this, this was, was a high function. This is a high function. This is a interesting. I was like, okay, I have these fabrics. It needs to rip off in one second and be thrown across the stage. Okay, bye. I mean, that's how. <laughs> <laughs> so this yeah. is Carmen in um, Guys and Dolls, and she is the dancer uh, for in Cuba. So it was sort of one of those Cuban nightclub numbers. It was a full ruffled skirt that um, had a, a big thigh slit. This was a huge dance number. So this is really, uh, also where Leah stands out is we make up a mock-up and we get it into rehearsal because mm -hmm. Anna we'll be doing her choreo, then we need to sort of lay some of our elements in, go away, figure out what's gonna be perfect. So by the time we get to tech dress, I think we even cue to cued. Cue to cue is when you go um, lighting cue, sound cue to the next one usually. We kind of go through the show. It's almost like a stumbling through the show with all the cues. And if there is a costume piece that's very important to a particular moment, that will be needed before tech dress. And I believe this skirt and the outfit um, was required before that as well. So there's a little extra pressure because this needs to be one of those awesome surprise moments um, that we had to sort of button the end of act one. Which we'll see in a second. There's a slide of it. This is oh, in the yeah. shop. <laughs> and this, I remember us being, yeah. And, and then there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes to that. And then it Lies across the air. I remember see the skirt in action. In the bar, like uh, hanging from the rail, like that thing really <laughs> went for it. Uh, and 130 shows of it. So it had to make sure that it could survive being ripped off and um, sort of whatever. And what did you end up using? Was it a magnet and a, and the and a pant hook? And she secretly turned oh. around away from the audience, undid the pant hook, and then the men just ripped it off of her. Uh, with the snaps and they just popped which is great yeah because it is that too is uh, it, we do a lot of uh, trying to make sure the magnet can hold because there was a dance moment before it as well where she has to do the whole sort of um, traditional Cuban uh, flamenco um, whatever it was 19 yeah 1930s dance um, and then uh, and then have it stay on. So again, working with Bonnie Jordan, who we've done a lot of shows with, who's a fantastic yeah. um, performer and uh, making this work for her and making her feel comfortable. This is the other thing too, like as you can see, this, yeah. this costume is very body bearing. Um, so we also, uh, sometimes when I am designing things that are small like this, I try and talk to the actor before we get into the room because I don't want anyone to be too surprised um they know they're doing this kind of show but you know they want to feel their best so it's also sometimes about finding lines of their bodies that they really like it's about finding the undergarments that they prefer uh and we and i think for this i think you build it on a on a bra that bonnie liked if um, we go back one slide we might get a little bit of um 
a, a better view maybe of the bra itself. Yeah. That's it. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so it's, it's pretty much a finished costume, but yeah, I think it's mounted onto an underwired bra. So she had that support. Yeah. Cause that's another thing. You don't want to be dancing full out there and worried that something's going to fly out because you know, there has to be <laughs> like <laughs> Super Bowl all over again. So, <laughs> Um, yeah. And then, uh, so those things are also talked, talked about extensively, uh, making sure that the actor feels fantastic. Again, they, you don't want them thinking about it. They want them just having a wonderful time. And also if, if I went into a fitting and she was like, I'm not really down with showing my whole midriff, I'm absolutely comfortable with changing that. Um, there is, um, it's not required. It's just uh, something that I'd taken from some of the references and there will always be a hundred other references. So it's trying to be open to those, those moments. Um, I always, you know, I'd like to say if you have to have it your way, then you should go into a closet and close the door and design your little show by yourself. You know, uh, it really is not that kind of event. It, it, um, it needs the energy of the performers. It needs the energy all the way from the sewers all the way down. And sometimes we try, like, we try and have moments where I, I will bring a couple different sets of, of buttons to the sewer. So the sewer gets to make a decision. Which button do they like on the garment that they've been working on? Because that helps infuse a little more of their energy into it as well. Um, it really, I think it, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. So this was super fun. And this was also like, I think, you know, fabrics for, from four different stores, but somehow it looked, I remember we were playing, like, it looks like it all came from the same catalog and the idea that the flowers and the, and the green all worked in the same tone. And that, we were pretty amazed that that worked so well. And, and again, in, in real light, it looks pretty insane and garish. And then when you throw it in Havana, <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. This was a perfect example, Dana, of you giving me half a meter of fabric and saying, Leela, can you make a bolero out of this that has sleeves and it has to get ripped off and yeah. it's lace? Bye. <laughs> I know, and you're like, I hate okay. You. And we did. I have to make sure I, I bring treats. <laughs> right? To make up. Motivated food. by food, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think the next sketch is probably Rocky. Oh, yeah, so then Rocky. Um, so when we talked earlier about watching movies and things like that, um, I make a point, try, I try not to watch the movies. Um, and it's not it's not because I don't think you shouldn't do it. For myself, I um, because I'm absorbing so much information as visual cues so quickly, I get really scared that I'm going to replicate something from the movie. Um, so I try not to because I'm trying to respect the other designs. It's not, you know, whatever. It is. That's my weird thing, and I'll get through it at some point. <laughs> but for Rocky Horror, it's kind of hard because Rocky Horror is like Rocky Horror. But so I never watched the movie, <laughs> and I think. <laughs> probably upset some fans but I, I just couldn't do it I, I did see a couple stills just so I had some idea but I, we really tried to go in our uh, tried to, to infuse a new energy into the production so this was the usherette reference so I was looking at um, old cinema um, usherettes there was this fantastic strange Barbie doll I think she's actually like um, a bellhop girl I'm not sure what she's up to just something <laughs> and then there was these, um, I think these were some burlesque ladies that had the fringe. And I really liked the idea of the red swag of the curtain because they would be, she would be in front of the red curtain that's all sort of destroyed and she is a version of it. But, and so there was also the idea that she was an original um, Avon theater escherette. So um, that she came from the theater. So, excuse me. So in the next sketch, yeah, you can see here's the black and white and Leela's got some notes written on them like what color is this because I think we were looking at the silk wool right from a catalog on this one. That's correct. Um, which is this beautiful silk wool that has a, this great sheen on it um, and of, of course we have to destroy it. That's the other thing is that costumes 
uh, are not like clothing from the store. They need to look like the person lives in them. So, uh, so as beautiful as you're coming in with a brand new item, mostly then you want the, the wear to come into this so the, so the character comes through. Um, especially if you're doing a modern show, and that's why we tend to shop at Value Village because it's great price, but also the clothes look like real clothes. They're not just coming off the hanger immediately and they have a lived in quality to them. So this was something you're, we, you'll see in the next sketch or when we get to it, it's just so beautiful. There it yeah, is. The colors are great. So this is sort of where we were at um, for the Usherette. So there's a bit of a Marcel wave going on. Uh, I think the mic was in her head, right? I'm pretty sure. No, I, think, I we... think so because of a quick change, I think. Yeah. So um, yeah. we put Erica on this because she had to play the usherette and magenta, which is usually what happens, that the mic pack is in the wig, <clears throat> under her wig prep. This was a quick change. So I think you zippered the back. No, was it the front? What did you do on this one? This is a no closure jacket. The yeah. front was just snaps and the skirt was your regular hook and zipper. Zipper, oh, so she just whipped at it really well. They did yeah. very well. I know there was a really fast change into it at the end of the show that yes. was first quite a bit. Um, certainly not the fast, it was the fastest quick change you've had to um, deal with in your career. Probably, yeah, probably. Maybe one of these ones? I think I I had to, to do a twelve second eunuch, from a eunuch into a Roman uh, <laughs> Roman centurion for one of Des's productions of Funny Thing Forum. Forum, and it yes. was ridiculous. The, yeah, you guys had to change in twelve seconds. It was very insane. So there was a lot of rigging going on here. So <laughs> this, you can see the fringe going along the line of the skirt. We were kind of playing with the, the, the little bellhop um, usherette jacket, the different tones. And then you see this, like they're having the red through the body and really showing that line up there and the shape of her, the contrast of the, of the gold. Now in the Avon Theater also is red and gold on the interior. So that was something we were trying to do. Oh, I'm talking too much. Okay, <laughs> the next one, sorry. And then this is the finished garment. What I love about this one, Dana, is that um, you pushed the traditional tailoring because the tails are never attached to the waistcoat. They're attached to the jacket. Yes, right. So you had an amazing reference from a Grammy show or something that was a modern piece. And so it was adapting the waistcoat to have a traditional tail into a bolero typed peak lapel jacket. So it was, it was a fun challenge. And this, this slide that we're all looking at is way before breakdown. This is its most pristine going to breakdown in a mere few minutes. So I had to capture this before it was broken down. Uh, and then the next one I think is in show. Yeah, there's Eric. It is. So, um, fully done out. And I think that, uh, yeah. Oh, and, and then we go to magenta. Well, speed through magenta. Magenta. Yeah, sure. It was sort of like um, uh, the references were mostly black latex um, sex wear, um, like made sex wear. So we sort of worked through that and trying to get a fabric that wasn't latex because no one wants to wear latex through a two hour show, I'm telling you. Um, so uh, finding the reflective quality. And for this, it was also getting to the fitting and having that moment where Leela and I were like, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. Based, just based on what was the right proportion for it from the bust to the waist. And we ended up having to recut the bodice twice, once? Just once. Once, yeah. But and it was very evident after our mock-up fitting. We were able to get in there with a, with a factory cotton and we could draw lines all over the drawing. actor on the body and then step back and take a look at the proportions on Erica, which was fantastic for her because... It worked for the, the character, it worked for her body. It was a perfect marrying of all actor, character, costume, everything. Yeah, and Erica is a real lover of vintage. She owns her own vintage store called Wild Thing Vintage. Um, so, you know, it, it, it was, again, a, a really strong collaboration. And then I think we can go to yeah. the slide, which there is, she is. rocky in, in, the, in the moment. 
which is, you know, really, I, I had so much fun with the show. I think we all had a really great time. It was, what's really fun is to watch tech dress with your cutters because you can hear them laughing or, <laughs> or, or reacting or being horrified or like, because it really is, they, they're so involved, but they actually get to see it do whatever it is. And, and going over there at the intermission and looking for smiles or tears or whatever, <laughs> it's so, <laughs> yeah, I'm so, I'm so proud of that wardrobe. And the this, um, people, like, it's oh, just, you know. this, this dress though, you said it wasn't latex, but I want to point out that it is still plastic. Yeah, it was plastic. <laughs> it's still plastic. So again, another problem solving moment with Dana handing me a yardage of fabric with that I open up, which is plastic. And even down to the white pleated trim around the neckline there, it's all plastic. It's almost like that um, tablecloth that you put over a picnic table. Yeah, yeah like a tie walk or something. <laughs> yeah, so I, it's not latex, but it is plastic. And then she had to wear this, Erica, the actor, had to wear this and dance in it. So we did things like back it with cotton. So she, her skin had something to sweat into. So just some of the technical stuff we did with that. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that's the end of my slides. So we can go to questions. Yeah, it's a great, great time for that. We've, we've dominated. <laughs> <Kel and Alan. laughs> <laughs> no, this is this has been great. I mean, I, I we were both actors for many years, and this is a revelation to both of us as well. I think you really, you know, um, unless you're right into it, there's so much that you that you never even think of. It's just magical, and trying to think of somebody performing even without dancing in plastic for two hours is making <laughs> me sweat. Oh, so um, a number of the the questions that came through actually you were able to uh, to address, and um, a number did have to do with the recycling of costumes and so forth. And, uh, and, and that's, of course, I think one that occurs to, um, to a lot of us. So what, it, I'm just wondering, what would you say, um, in, do most shows, at least at the Stratford Festival, have some elements that were already in wardrobe? Would you, would you say it, that? It's a rarity if you're doing a show that's completely built. I would say probably most shows are at least 40%. Um, depending on what period it is, uh, certainly for our historical shows as well, um, because there is a lot there. You could take a Elizabethan bodice and do a new stomacher on it, or and new details, and it will revive it, and um, or re rebuild sleeves if they've rotted out or things like that. So I'd say forty percent, Leela, makes sense. That's a. I'm not sure of the percentage, but that is a huge portion of my workload is incorporating the stock and. Uh, and reviving it, uh, re renewing it with whatever the designer is thinking for um, their look in particular, because that's the challenge that Dan is up against is taking somebody's past design and then making it hers and then giving it to me and saying, here you go, make it mine now. So, yeah, and there's, it, I would, I'd safely say every show has stock in it. So, which is part of the creative fun too. I love that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really sure. interesting too. Um, one of the questions is, um, do you prefer designing for um, specific time periods? You know, are you happier with the Elizabethan yeah. stuff or modern stuff or dance, uh, musicals? Yeah, the best, the best part is, is the new project, really. Like, I, I, my father uh, was a realtor and we moved 18 times in my small town or something like that 16 times 12 times my mom will give me a phone call and be like it wasn't that much but so i'm <laughs> and i like things to be changing uh i love new things to look at and stuff like that so i'm really comfortable with different periods i would i think i'd get super bored if i just stuck uh with and i also do sets too which i don't get to do a lot but i i like you know it, i am in, i hope that i'm in a constant state of I try to stay away from doing one thing all the time. And Leela, you get to do all sorts of stuff. I, I can't pinpoint. I saw that question earlier and I thought, oh my gosh, I love, I love drafting Elizabethan. I love getting back to that old um, historical uh, shape because it's very different from modern and how we can manipulate the body with um, boning and the lines I draw, it's so fun. Um, modern I find it easy as long as 
you think it was fun. So, yeah. Oh, did we lose someone? Oh, oh I can't hear. Oh, you're there? Yes. Um, so, okay, actually, there's there's another uh, question here that's quite uh, interesting. You were talking about the reference materials that you use um, to uh, kind of research various types of, um, of um, costumes. Pardon me, but one question here is for historical periods, what documents do you use to verify the authenticity of the clothing worn in the period and by whom? So if you are dealing with something, obviously not all plays that are, say, set in the Renaissance, uh, or, or that, that is all, all Shakespeare plays are not going to be set in the Renaissance, depending on what the director wants to do. But if you are doing something that's, um, you know, quite distant and you want it to be period authentic, what do you, uh, what do, you do for that? Well, you can't, I, I usually look at the portraits. Um, so if I can find, if it's a specific an Earl from this area, this time period, I can look at a, a bunch of um, historical portraits from the BNA or, or whatever um, museum is housing them. It's usually the idea. Um, uh, and so, I mean, I, I just did a play about Sarah Bernhardt. So it was also looking at lots of the really early photographs of her and trying to be true to some of those things. Uh, um, but sometimes, you know, you, unless you're trying to replicate perfectly, which I always feel is, feels a bit film, but I mean, if you're doing the queen, that fantastic, um, is it called the queen? Yeah. Though the actual play one, I can't remember the play one was, um, which is, uh, I'm blanking anyway, where you're doing Elizabeth going through the ages and you are actually re reproducing the, the clothing. The so crown. way easier when it's a photographed, um, period. But again, going back to the historical portraits and making sure you can also um, contact different museums that study, you know, particular royal families, get referenced that way. Um, uh, you know, you do your part, but I always do expect, especially when I'm doing uh, World War or Army wear, I have all these Army books and I try and use those references, but I'm sure I... I may get a thing wrong here or there too. And I will get a letter from someone who will point it out, which is great, you know, cause I want to learn it, but I do my best um, when I can. I do about the same. I it research, 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 because not only does Dana's images have to represent that status and that, that time period, but then my pattern shapes have to too. So it's all research. Um, actually, good questions just come up in the Q and A, and that has to do with if you're if you're looking at something that's that's copyrighted or so, you know something that's proprietary. Um, do you do you come up against that often, and do you do things that you, know, you can make an alteration and then it's it's yours, or is is that an issue? Well, it's it's interesting. Um, uh, I think it. Uh, I tend to let it go. Like the things go, they go into stock. They've had their moments. Um, and I guess if you pulled someone's suit and you put the same suit on, yes, it could be someone else's design. That is intellectual property in a way. Um, I did a show at Shaw a couple of years ago, which was like a Sherlock and they're doing another Sherlock. And the designer just called me and said, are you okay if I use some of your original costumes? And I was like, yes, please do. I don't need credit. You know, this is, this is sort of that thing, but I, um, uh, but I think, yeah, there is that question. I know when you do film, there is a bunch of lawyers usually on set that are checking uh, if you're using a particular garment from Banana Republic and it's, it's visibly that, that needs to be signed off on. But we haven't really encountered that in theater yet. I don't really come up against that. Um, we are very diligent to take labels off if they're showy, if there's any kind of label. And Everything I do uh, pattern wise is on my own anyway. So there's, um, it all belongs to me, I guess, and the festival jointly. So, yeah. I think it be to be discovered actually. And <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> actually, that was something I must say I had wondered in relation to Chicago, because I know that um, the production of Chicago that was to have taken place this season, one of the conditions was everything had to be new, right? Everything had to be different in terms of the choreography, et cetera, compared to the Broadway show. And I wonder, did, did that extend to, to costuming or would the costuming have been all different anyway? 
Uh, it was it was it was part of the agreement that it did not look like anything that was on Broadway. So I was sent to Broadway to watch the production to make sure that I don't replicate anything. So um, and that actually was kind of pretty easy to do because it was very a modern take, minimalist take, and we were doing a, a very period. Um, well, it's period, but it's again, it's it's me, so it's through a lens uh, with a little bit of modernity to it. But yeah. And I guess, I think this will be our final question because we now are a little past noon. Uh, what's the most challenging play you've had to costume and why? Uh, the most challenging I've had uh, recently was Father Come, uh, Comes Home to the War, part one, two, and three, which is by Susie Lauren Parks, which is um, uh, a play about, um, uh, a family of black slaves and then it goes into civil war and goes back and it's um uh, a modern retelling of it and so it had to have modern black culture and some period references and uh there are not a lot of black costume designers in canada so i was lucky enough to be brought on to this but having to rely heavily on on to reference and trying to find reference that hopefully wasn't stereotypic, and also working with each actor to find out what was resonating with them, what other areas I needed to go. It was a, it was a really interesting, interesting show to do. And also there were some historical costumes in it too that were period and getting reenactment Civil War stuff, which, which is um, a bit crazy. So that was the, that was probably the most difficult because it's not my lens to, not my natural lens um, or my culture. So I needed to be able to be open and, um, and react to what was happening to these people and their character and, and the history of each actor. All right, well, I, I think that's, uh, I think that's it. I think we'll wrap it up at this point because as Alan said, we've, um, We've had our hour, and this was, again, absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for um, everything that you shared it with us and giving us a, a kind of a look into um, the, I mean, I'm sure we all knew it was a lot of work, but the little miracles that you're pulling off every, every day with every show, uh, I'm sure many of us didn't have much of a sense of, of that. So thank you very, very much. And, well, I hope to... We all hope to see you and your work, um, you know, next year, if, if not this year. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Great. On Take behalf care, of everyone. the Master and the Stratford Festival, thanks for joining us today. We hope that you can join us for Taming of the Shrew tomorrow and a little bit of trivia. Thanks to Kel and Alan and Dana and Leela.